My name is Reza John Vidadi. Um, I'm 40 years old from London. I've been to Kabra a number of times, which is a blessing from uh, Allah. My understanding of Imam Hussein is limited to my abilities and my knowledge. My understanding is probably a small drop in the ocean of who Imam Hussein really is and the closeness that Imam Hussein has to Allah. For me, Azadari is in many ways and in many um, methods you can remember Imam Hussein and the Ahl al Bayt. So when we talk about Imam Hussein, I believe Imam Hussein is a part of the Ahl al Bayt. And Ahl al Bayt came with one message. The message was various in each of the imamat or the leadership of the 12 imams, but it's also part of the message of Sayyidah Fatima Zahra, the daughter of the Holy Prophet, and the message of the Holy Prophet himself, which is Islam. So these are all combined together for us as Shias. Imam Hussein, our remembrance of Imam Hussein or any of the imams uh, has different methods throughout the years or throughout the ages or cultures. Before we used to remember Imam Hussein in the mosques or the Islamic centers, Husseiniyas, in the homes. Now what we find is a lot of people have decided to take the message of Imam Hussein and take it out to the streets, to the parts of the world where they live. So be it in the, in the US, in Canada or UK or Africa or anywhere. There's different organizations that promote the message of Imam Hussein through charitable work, feeding the homeless, having advertisements on billboards, um, giving water out on the day of Ashura, the procession that occurs in London and many other big cities around the world, and thousands attend to remember Imam Hussein. So any form of uh, remembrance of Imam Hussein that promotes his message in a positive way, I would be happy to call Azadari and I would encourage others to do. So we have to adapt our method of remembrance of Imam Hussein or Azadari to suit the time and the place that we live in. There is the concept of visitation, ziyara, and pilgrimage or hajj, for example. Hajj is the obligatory visitation of the Mecca, which is uh, incumbent on all Muslims at least once in their lifetime if they can go. Now the visitation of the Imams or the Holy Prophet or those special personalities you can go as many times as you want, and there's a lot of benefit in there. Why is there a lot of benefit in the visitation of the important personalities within Islam? The reason being is these personalities were so close to Allah, so close to God, that they embodied positive energies. These positive energies are with them in the places that are buried. So when we visit the places like Karbala, when we visit the places like Najaf, these cities or the, the mosques which are center of the cities, the mosque of Imam Ali, the, the mosque of uh, Imam Hussein and all the other Imams, they have positive energy within that area because these personalities gave out positive energy. And this positive energy continues even after they've passed away. We have in Islam, whoever becomes martyred, they're not dead, they're still alive. So these personalities there, they're giving positive energy. When we go to visit these personalities, when we go to touch the shrines, when we walk on the marble that is their shrines, and we enter that bubble of energy, we also receive this positive energy within us, and then hopefully continue that with our lives. That's why you hear a lot of visitors who come to the shrine of Imam Hussein, or Imam Ali, or any of the Imams. They say we come from a lifestyle that we feel we have everything that we need, be it food, shelter, but we're lacking in positive energy. We're lacking in spiritual energy. So when we come and visit the holy shrines, we get positive energy, we get uh, spirituality, and it gives us the strength to go back to live the, and continue the life that we have in the West, for example. So for me, visitation of these personalities, if you want to look at it in a modern way, is re-energizing your spiritual and your inner being as opposed to just having everything that we have for the physical being in the West. 
Well, my, my first visit to Karbala is interesting because my father took us to my first visit to the holy shrines within Iraq. And he had made a promise to my mother. He made a promise to my mother. He said, I'm going to, inshallah, take you because he was ill. And my mother said, you know, you promised me you're going to take us to Karbala. I don't want you to pass away. And he said, I promise I'll take you. So then he passes away in July and his uh, body we had to take to bury. We didn't want to bury him in England. Uh, we decided not to bury him in uh, Iran. So we decided to bury him in Iraq, Najaf. And it wasn't an easy trip. It was very difficult, but we ended up going. Now me, my older brother and my mother, we went with him with his body to Karbala where he did tawaf around the shrine uh, of Imam Hussein and Abu Fadl Abbas, then to the shrine of Imam Ali. And then after he was prayed upon in that shrine, he was taken to and buried in Wadi as -Salam. So he completed his promise to us and to my mom that I will take you. It wasn't alive when he took us, but he, he was the reason why we went. Then after that, again, I went a few years later after I'd gone through some problems and tragedies in my life, I wanted to connect and recharge my energy batteries. And I made a promise to Imam Hussein. I said, I don't, I don't have the money. I don't know how I'm going to do it. But I want you to sort and help me fix the problem that I have. And inshallah, once it's fixed, I'll find a way to crawl to you if I have to. And Alhamdulillah, miraculously, the money came from somewhere. It worked out. I ended up going. And on that trip, I made a documentary and I felt closer to the Ahl al-Bayt because I had gone at a different stage of my life. It wasn't grieving for my father. I was more able to connect with the Ahl al-Bayt. One of the, or many of the visits that I had to Karbala or Iraq was during the Arba'in. And the last trip I had in 2014 is when um, ISIS or Daesh had taken the north of Iraq. And we decided to do a documentary about the importance of visitation, specifically during the time when it's dangerous to go. And Alhamdulillah, we managed to get um, a lot of footage, we managed to get a lot of interviews, and everybody said that the, 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 the fear that the enemies of Islam, the terrorists who were taking over the north of Iraq, wanted to put into the heart of the visitors, the zawar of Imam Hussein, didn't work. Not only did it not work, it made people be more encouraged to go in larger numbers. So it's important that when there is danger or when there's this threat to say, don't come to Imam Hussein or you'll be hurt. We realize that we actually want to go more because we're, this is the ideology that we have is that you can't scare us. For us to go in the path of Imam Hussein and lose our life in the path of Imam Hussein is martyrdom, which is the highest state you can give to a Muslim. So there are many occasions where it's important to visit the shrine of Imam Hussein and other personalities in Iraq. So they say Arafah is very good to go if you can't go Hajj. Um, it's good to go in Muharram, in Ashura. It's good to go very specifically in uh, Arba'in, the 40th day after Imam Hussein was martyred. And Alhamdulillah, you see that the biggest procession, the biggest number of people go during Arba'in, which is the 40th after Imam Hussein. Now, obviously, Arba'in is not the only time that we go. A lot of people go throughout the year. I personally, I go for the walk when I go for Arba'in because when you arrive in Karbala, the shrine is so packed that it's very difficult to get in. And me as an individual, for me to connect with the personalities from uh, the shrine, so Imam Hussein and Imam Ali, I need peace and quiet. If people are pushing me and they're you know, struggling to get in and there's the pressure on me, I can't focus spiritually. So when I go outside of Arba'in, for me is the time to utilize, to try and connect with the Imams more, especially Imam Hussain and Imam Ali. But Arba'in, there's so much experiences and so much life stories that you can have when you go. Many stories we had, we met the family who were descendants of Malik Ashtar. So from the Najaf to Karbala and from Basra and from many other cities, there are many buildings, they're called Mokibs. They're very uh, large and they, ha they house people that come so they can sleep at night, the pilgrims, and they beg you to go inside so they can feed you, massage your feet and look after you. One of the mokibs, one of the buildings that was there belonged to the descendants of Malik Ashtar. So we were really happy. We went up, we took pictures with them, we said greetings to them, we filmed them. 
And it was interesting because Malik Ashtar was the, uh, one of the great companions of Imam Ali. So his descendants, you know, proud of the heritage that put a big sign up. Many stories you'll find in Arba'in and every time you go, there's new stories. It's not really repetitive. It's always different. It's always something interesting. But I think that the most powerful story for me from the Arba'in procession and Arba'in walk is before we always hear about say the Zainab and we always hear she went through so much hardship after Imam Hussein was martyred because she was given so much responsibility until she can give that responsibility back to the fourth Imam, Imam Sajjad. So for many days and weeks, she was responsible to look after the children and the sick. And she was abused, but she gave, you know, so, such courageous replies. And you always think, okay, say the Zenith. But until you do the walk, until you walk from wherever it is, Najaf or Basra or whatever, and you walk for two to three days to the shrine of Imam Hussein, and then you get blisters on your feet and your body aches. And sometimes it rains and your body gets cold and you may catch a cold and you experience all the hardship when it's really uh, hot under the sun and it's really cold under the night and then you feel tired. That's when you start to think, because when you walk, you realize that walking is a way of reflection because you can't really talk too much when you walk, you get tired. So a lot of people just go into focus, into reflection, into thinking about themselves, their lives, the story of Imam Hussein. It's one of the best ways to have reflection about yourself and your whole existence. Then you start to think about Imam Hussein. Then you start to think about Sayyidah Zainab, the children, when they were chained, when they were on top of camels without protection. And then you start to feel tears come into your eyes. You start to feel your heart softens for Sayyidah Zainab. That's when you connect with Sayyidah Zainab. Saying that Zainab, her shrine, alhamdulillah, in Damascus, is there to go and visit. But if you want to truly know what Sayyidah Zainab went through, you want to truly know how magnificent and how brave and how strong she was as an individual and personality, from the day her mother was martyred until the last day she was alive and throughout when she looked after the family of the Holy Prophet, is you have to do the walk. You have to go to Arba'in and walk from Najaf to Karbala. Walk from the father to the son to remember the daughter and the sister and the mother who gave children, who gave brother and who gave her father and her mother towards the path of Islam. That's when you know the emotions and the power of Islam through Sayyidah Zainab. So if you want to know the essence, the heart, the emotions of Islam, you have to walk from Najaf to Karbala. You have to experience Sayyidah Zainab's hardship that she went through. And once you experience that, your heart and the way you look at Muharram, the way you look at Sayyidah Zainab, the way you look at the children that suffered after the Battle of Ashura will never be the same. And you feel such a uh, strong and powerful connection with Ahl al-Bayt. The Arba'in walk, many people do it in different uh, ways. Um, it's about 1,500 posts between Najaf and Karbala. That's the majority of the path that people go. Other people come, some came from Iran. When I went there, I met people who had come from the south of Iran, from the west of Iran. Some people came from Basra, which was more than uh, three days walk. So mashallah, many people come from all over the world. I met people from North Africa, from Europe, from America, from Asia, from uh, Far East, everywhere they came from. And so the three day walk, you, you know, you walk from Najaf to Karbala, there's places where you stop, you can rest, you can eat, uh, there's refreshments, all of this paid for by the people of Iraq. Nobody takes money from you. This is a country that had a war for two, three years. And yet these people have the courage, the strength and the love for Imam Hussein to the extent where when you go, they don't charge you to feed you, to house you, to look after you, to massage you. They completely do it all from, the, from their own pocket. For me personally, when I uh, go to visit the, any, any of the holy shrines or even Hajj, I don't believe I'm about to go or arrive until I put my foot on that land and next to that mosque. Because between my intention of getting onto the plane and arriving to the location, God knows what will happen. From the moment I land and arrive into that airport of that country until I get to the shrine, God knows what will happen. And until I arrive into the city, the borders of the city, and until I put my foot into the mosque, God knows what will happen. So it's until I arrive and I put my foot into the mosque of Imam Hussein, for example, or the mosque of Imam Ali, for example, or mosque of Imam Reza, 
I don't believe that I'm going to arrive here. It's for me still as Allah giving me the permission to arrive. And then when I arrive and I put my foot down and I arrive there, then I know I've arrived. And if anything happens to me there, Alhamdulillah, I arrive to the mosque. So when I do the walk or any other time that I go outside of even Arba'in, for me, it's like, have you really invited me? Am I, am I really going to arrive and see your golden dome? Am I really going to put foot in your shrine? And until I arrive, I keep my emotions. Try not to get emotional. It's only when I arrive, especially, for example, Mashhad, I have a strong connection with Imam Reza. And I was there once for Muharram. It was a really amazing experience. Until I arrive and put my foot into the holy land that is the mosque of Imam Hussein, be it in Arba'in or any other time, I hold my emotions. And then when I arrive, I try to let go and I try to connect with the Imam. And just to thank him for letting me come. So we believe in these personalities, they give us intercession. Intercession between us, human beings, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is mentioned in the Quran, Ayatul Kursi, uh, the chapter of uh, the cow, Baghara. So if Allah and Imam Hussein have invited us, the first thing is to thank them. The first thing is to kiss the ground and thank them to say, thank you Allah for allowing me to come and visit this personality. Because it means you're allowing me to be inside that positive energy so I can fix my spirituality, so I can fix my faith, my personality, my problems. Why I can fix my personality while I'm here? In the, towards the shrine of Imam Hussein, walking towards his shrine from Imam Ali, it's because this is positive energy. It's a river of positive energy. It is a river towards Jannah. It is a river towards paradise. And if I go into that stream, I'm going to be cleansed if I follow what that stream tells me. Not if I go and ask Allah to forgive me because I've visited Imam Hussein, then I come back to my old way of doing things which were wrong. No, I go there with sincerity of the heart, with the pureness of the heart, and ask Allah to help me to clear all my mistakes, to clear all my bad habits, to get rid of everything that caused me to be away from the Ahl al-Bayt and away from Allah. So by going towards Imam Hussein, and thanking him to allowing us to go visit him, we're thanking Allah for ourselves. So for us, when we walk through those three, four days and the pain that is caused to us because of the walking, these are ways of us connecting with Ahl al-Bayt more, humbling our heart and our soul. So when we arrive into the shrine, we can look, thank and be grateful for the opportunity and inshallah to receive the message that the Holy Prophet the whole, the whole point of Imam Hussein was to remind people, and he said this, he goes, I've come to remind you of my grandfather's message. As with any visitation, seeing a family or a friend, there's always a goodbye. And visiting the shrines the, of Imam Ali, Imam Hussein, or any of the Imams, it comes to the point where no matter how long your journey is, you have to say goodbye. And I don't like to say the word goodbye. I, I prefer to say, inshallah, we'll see you later. Inshallah, invite us again so we can come see you again. But it's hard, right? Because you're leaving, you're going to go back to your life. But for me, leaving is not as hard as for some people because, and I'll tell you why. For me, it's like I've come because I have a position in my life somewhere else, right? Be it in this country or another country. I've come and you help me to remind me of what I should be. And I have to take that, bottle it up, put it inside my heart and go back to my life and make changes changes for myself, become a better person inside, um, break away the bad habits that I had, destroy the bad habits that I had created, become positive. And with that positivity, influence my family, be positive for them, be strong for them, be patient for them in the way of God. Do the same for friends and then do the same for people that are not friends, that are not family. This is part of the whole process that we have. A lot of times, you know, families go, friends go, and they say, oh, I can't say goodbye, I don't want to leave. I'm like, thank God that you had the opportunity to, to come to these holy places. Thank God that you had the opportunity to visit Imam Hussein, because he wanted to put a sparkle in your heart, so when you go back to your life, you're not like everybody else in the rat race, like a robot, going to work, coming home, eating, paying the bills, going to work, maybe having a holiday in the middle. No, he's sent you, he's asked you to come, he's put a sparkle in your heart, and then he sends you back. 
so you can make changes in your life and make changes in other people's life in a positive way. That's how I see when I leave the Ahl al-Bayt, is like, thank you for charging up my spiritual energy and spiritual batteries so I can go back and be positive for other people. For me, one of, I can give an example of one of the changes that, I don't know if it's a change or if it's something that I've added to my life is, when I go to visit the Imam, I'm like, okay, I'm, I've come, I've seen your shrine, I've spoken to you, I feel charged up now, I wanna go back, I wanna do something positive to promote you. And something that I've done f since 2012 is try to promote other people to go, especially through the media work that I've done, the short films or the documentaries, is to put the love and emotional connection of the viewer, uh, of Imam Hussein, into the heart of the viewer through those videos and documentaries. So that they have a yearning, they have a desire to go and visit the holy shrines in Iraq and in Iran. So that they, they then have that personal connection. So I want to, I, I want to be used by the uh, Ahl al-Bayt to put a sparkle into the heart of the viewer and then they themselves will go and then they will build that relationship with Ahl al-Bayt. The whole journey of visitation, be it in Arba'in or any other time, can be summarized many ways by many people. I would say that it's a journey to love and truth. <laughs>